exalt the Lord right now. Father, we just bless you and praise you. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your, for your abiding presence, Lord. That you never leave us or forsake us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to be touched by your presence, by your manifest presence, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the great love wherewith you have loved us. We bless you today. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in every area of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that all of our children are taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of our children. Thank you, Lord, that they will not depart from the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Amen. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You all may be seated. Thank the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it as always. Great job. Thank you, Suzanne and the worship team. Amen. For helping us to kind of block everything else out and all the other noise and junk that goes on in our lives that makes us able to just kind of focus in on what's really important and what everything else consists of and, and exists because of. Praise the Lord. So God is good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you all for being here this morning. God bless you. Amen. And uh, just got a couple of things I'd like to share with you that I know you just can't wait for. I was uh, talking about Genesis. I was looking back through Exodus, and I see where Moses had the first tablet that could connect to the cloud. <laughs> Amen. And you know, I, I you see these kids. Well, it's not just kids. It's not just the millennials. It's just computers, cell phones, smartphones, all this stuff. I, I got a flip phone, and I'm still struggling to figure out how to use it most of the time. But maybe if we start telling people the brain is an app, they'll start using it. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'll show you the trouble I have with my emails. Uh, my email password has been hacked. That's the third time I've had to rename my cat. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, but that's the truth. <laughs> Get down to my computer in there, you'll see my cat, my cat's name. But I'm not telling you what it is because I'll have to change it again. <laughs> praise the Lord. Okay, well, praise the Lord. I'm just going to give you one more little nugget of uh, information here. When, when I was a kid, I had a disease. Most of you don't know this, but I haven't shared it with you. But I had this disease that required me to eat dirt three times a day. It was the only way I could survive. Thank God my older brother told me about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll forever be indebted to Dave. Praise God. All right. Praise the Lord. God is good. Yes. Amen. And uh, I just want to share some things with you this morning. I appreciate uh, Tim opening and, and what he shared this morning uh, because it is right in line with what I want to talk to you about, what I feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking, as well as the songs that uh, Suzanne and y'all chose uh, for this morning. It was great. And I want to start off with, uh, uh, if you want to go, Peter, if you will, go to 1 Samuel. Uh, no, let me take that back. Uh, go to Revelation 1, 5, and 6. But I'm going to read, first of all, uh, out of the, uh, the Message Bible. And I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 12, verses 3 through 7. This is the Message Bible. I'm just reading it out of this so Peter doesn't have to try to flip back and forth because it's not that simple to do. I'll flip back and forth. Can you do that? Yeah. Well, if you would, then that'd be great. Matthew, what? Matthew, this is the Message translation of Matthew chapter 12, 
verses uh, 3 through 7. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was a hungered, and that they that were with him? How he entered into... That's, this is the King James Version, and I, I need the message. That's what I was afraid of. That's why I have the message here. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, Really? Didn't you ever read what David and his companion did when they were hungry? How they entered the sanctuary and ate fresh bread off the altar? Bread that no one but priests were allowed to eat. And didn't you ever read in God's law that priests carry out their temple duties and doing so break the Sabbath rules all the time and it's not held against them? There is far more at stake here than religion. If you had any idea what this scripture meant, I prefer a flexible heart to an inflexible ritual. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Now, I want, I'd like you now, Peter, if you would go to uh, 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 9. Now, I'm gonna, uh, while he's pulling that up, one of the things that you find about Jesus is he found himself in the Scripture. And you see him put that forth all, over and over. Luke chapter 4 is a perfect example where he, he goes and he finds in the Scripture where it's speaking of him, he says. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. Now, how did he know that? He just believed that this was written about him. Well, this is where we're supposed to find ourselves. And what we've done religiously is find our faults and our failures and our weaknesses. And I talked about this a little bit last week. But what we're supposed to find is who we are in Christ. Yes. Amen? So that's what Jesus did, and that's what he expects us to do with the Bible. And we've turned the Bible into this book that just beats us up and... and defines all of our stupidity and our failures and our weaknesses and he n intended for it to show us our identity in him yes. who we really are in Christ right so then get David uh, came David to Nob to uh, Ahimelech the priest and Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him why art thou alone and no man with thee now I should have prefaced this before but I will now just in case you haven't read this David is running away from Saul. Saul's trying to kill him. David's been anointed the king. He's been declared the king. But he is not in the place of the king. Saul is still alive. He's still ruling as king. And because of David's success, not only in battle, but with the people and with God, Saul wants to kill him. He's jealous of him. He's got a devil. He's just freaked out. and He wants to kill David. So he's chasing David everywhere he goes. He tries to destroy him. So David comes to Elimelech, the priest, and Elimelech was afraid at the meeting of David. He was afraid because he knew Saul was after him. And said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? And David said unto Elimelech, the priest, The king hath commanded me a business. Now David's lying because he, he can't tell Elimelech, the priest, that Saul's trying to kill him, or Elimelech will probably rat him out and turn him in or do something else. So he's, he's telling him that the king told me to come here. And has said to me, let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now therefore, what is under the, thine hand, give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or what there is present. So David's hungry, his, the people that are with him are hungry, they don't have anything to eat, and he says, give me whatever you got. At least five loaves of bread, or whatever you have. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under my hand, and there, but there is hallowed bread, or holy bread, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessel of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the show bread, which was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdsmen that belonged to Saul. And David said unto Ahimelech, there, And is there none, not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, 
the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah. Behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it. And there is no other save that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it me. So, the showbread, we've talked about this before. In the temple, there is in the holy place, not in the holy of holies, but in the holy place before you get to the holy of holies, there was a table of showbread. It was two stacks of six loaves of bread. And that was for the priest to eat while they were doing their thing. It was, it was holy. It was only for them. They were the only ones that were allowed to eat it by the law. So that's what David's eating. And as far as the law is concerned, what he's doing is illegal. It's wrong. But he's eating it anyway. So now let's go to, now he, again, he's the king. Sorry if I'm being a little confusing here, but let me, I'm just going to take a little while to get this thing started. But um, again, David is a king without a throne. God has declared him a king, but the natural world is not allowing him to exercise that position. All right? God has promised and ordained him and anointed him king. All right? Now let's go to Revelation chapter 1, 5, and 6. Now again, we're wanting to find not only the stories, the, the history that's in here, but the spiritual significance of that history. Because none of this stuff happened by accident. It happened, and then God uses it to show not only himself or Jesus, but us. Right. And if we're not looking for that, we're not going to find what it is we're supposed to be looking for in the Bible. We're just going to find a bunch of history and a bunch of rules and regulations that none of us have been able to keep. So, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Though there's your identity as far as God's concerned. Yes. All right? So the, the story of David is also a story, as I said, in type of the king of kings, yes. Jesus himself. And us, then, by extension, yes. mm -hmm. which is why we see this in, in the book of Revelation. So I want to look at some of the comparisons in the scripture that we just read from 1 Samuel. King David, as I said, is running for his life from Saul. Mm -hmm. David has been anointed king by the prophet Samuel, and he was simply waiting for the old regime under the reign of Saul to pass off the scene right. in order for him to take his position ordained of God. Amen? David was the king not yet recognized. Yes. All right? Matthew chapter 2, verse, uh, let's see, 13 through 15. Matthew 2, 13 through 15. When they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring the word of Herod and, and will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So here's the, here's the example. David's running from Saul because he wants to kill him because he's the real king. Herod wants to kill Jesus because he knows this is the king of kings. This is the one prophesied, right? So he's, he wants to kill Jesus. So they got to, his parents take him and run for their lives away from this king. Amen. Luke 22, verse 2. Chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him. Now the Pharisees want to kill him. He's an adult. He's come back from Egypt to, to Israel. He's lived his uh, young life there. He's now 30 years old, 30-odd some years. And the chief priests and the scribes now are trying to kill him. They're, they're trying to trap him some way that they can put him to death, right? Because they feared the people. Why did they fear the people? They feared that the people were going to follow him. And not follow them anymore. The same thing Saul was afraid of is the people, they, you know, the singing the song, Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. So he's jealous and he's fearful that he's going to lose his, his power and his authority and so forth. 
is position, right? All right, look at John chapter 10 and verse 10 now. John 10, 10. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's coming for us. Amen? The thief is trying to destroy us. He's trying to kill us and to rob from us. But Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life, we might have life, and that we would have it more abundantly. So we are under attack as well. Yeah. Amen? You see the parallel. All right, so Jesus was pursued just like David. The Pharisees, King Herod pursued Jesus just like Saul pursued David. Amen? 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. The devil is roaming around seeking who he can devour. Amen. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, and that's us. Amen. That's We is, is who he's after, praise the Lord, that he wants to destroy. So the Pharisees, they saw Jesus as a threat to their reign. We are a threat to to the territory, to the kingdom of this world, to Satan himself. If we would apply, amen, what Jody was talking about here earlier and what we've all been talking about here recently, and that is we have to take our authority. As kings and priests, we have to exercise that authority or the enemy will destroy us. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. He'll destroy the kingdom that uh, we're in physically. He can't destroy the kingdom from whence we have come, the kingdom of heaven, but we are here to establish that kingdom on earth. We are here to set up a new kingdom. The old reign has been finished. It's over with, amen, and we need to take over, amen, as a result. So just like David, Jesus was like David and like us as, a, as well. He was a king not yet recognized. David wasn't recognized as a king. Jesus wasn't recognized as a king, and believe me, Neither are we. Right. Praise the Lord. And sadly, many times we're not even recognized by ourselves right. as to who and what we really are. Amen. Right. Certainly not from the world around us. Praise the Lord. But because they were priests, so David, because they were priests, these, these people had a right. The, uh, the offspring of Levi or, or Aaron, amen, had a right to to eat the bread. They had a legal right to eat from the table of shoe bread. Amen? Well, let me show you something that Jesus says about us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10. They had a legal right, and they accused David of doing wrong. Right. In Matthew, we heard where that's what that was all about. They, the, actually, the disciples were eating wheat on the, on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, what? Haven't you read the Scriptures? What about David when he ate the shoe bread? Right? And that's what he was talking about. You, you're wanting to make religion. This is all about religion. It was never about religion. I'll have mercy. Amen. And not sacrifice. If you could understand that, you'd understand what, this scripture, what these scriptures are all about. Right? So he tells us, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. We have an altar that we eat from that these priests don't have a right to eat from. Amen. And that's Jesus himself, the bread of life. Praise the Lord. Amen. So Jesus, the king priest... Scripture says, after the order of Melchizedek, who doesn't operate from, a, from carnal commandments, praise God, he operates by the power of endless life. So think about it. If that's the king of kings and we are kings and priests, then that's where we rule. That's how we operate, amen, not by rules, not by commandments, amen, but by an eternal life. God life that's in us, amen, is how we are to live. That's how we are to operate, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He, he's introducing, amen, grace. Clear back here in the Old Covenant. We think, well, the grace doesn't come until the... Oh, no. God is grace. There was grace available. And that's why God, David was a man after God's own heart. He had an insight, a revelation into the grace of God and the goodness of God. That's why he writes in the Psalms, you know, he, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, whose iniquities he will remember no more. Find somebody else in the Old Covenant that would dare say something like that. Praise the Lord. So he's introducing grace. Now remember, David and his men were fleeing from Saul, right? They were fleeing from Saul, and because they were hungry, they entered the sanctuary. All right? John chapter 6, verse uh, 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Yeah. We are the temple. Yeah. Christ is in us. 
we have a right to this altar that they don't have a right to. And we can eat from the bread of life. Amen. And we come to him and we'll never hunger again. Praise the Lord. Amen. So David asked the priests if they have any bread. And they say, well, there's no bread here except the showbread, which is hallowed or holy bread. And the table of showbread had two stacks, as I said, six loaves of bread on each, in each stack. Now, the word showbread in Smith's Bible Dictionary, you can look it up for yourself, is defined as the bread of face. Amen? The bread of face or the bread through which God is seen. Have you ever wondered why it's called showbread or shoebread? It's showing us God. It's God trying to show us something. Amen. And, and the dictionary defines that. The Bible dictionary defines that as the, the bread of face. Or the bread through which God is seen. So if you look at this, it's a revelation of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, the true bread of life. Praise the Lord. I'm going to show you. The first stack. He was, there's six loaves, right? He was crucified. He died. He was buried. He was quickened. He was raised. And he's seated at the right hand of God. The second stack, I was crucified with him. I died with him. I was buried with him. I was quickened with him. I was raised with him. I am seated with him yes. in heavenly places yes. in Christ Jesus. See, he didn't just die for me. I've said this before. He didn't just die for you. He died as you. Yes. He died as me. God, t God makes this very personal. This was my death. Yes. This was my crucifixion. Yes. This was my burial. This was my God bring, giving me life, God life. Yes. I've been born again. I have the life of God. I've been raised up. Yes. Amen. And seated with him in heavenly places. This is how God sees us individually. Amen. He died as me. He didn't die so that I wouldn't have to. His death was my death. Amen. His crucifixion was my crucifixion. Amen. I was buried with him in baptism. That's, that's, the, that's the symbolism of baptism. Yes. Amen. So I was buried with him. I was quickened. I was made alive with his life. Yes. I have His resurrection life in me, the Holy Spirit that raises us, amen, to life, amen. I am right now, right this very second, seated with Him in heavenly places. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. So are you. Yes. Praise God. Those are six things that we are made partakers of in the redemptive work of Jesus. Yes. David wrote this when he was fleeing from Saul. Look at Psalms uh, 23 and 5. Remember, he, he knew what it was like to be hungry. He knew what it was like to be, be near death or, 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 or under the, uh, the uh, uh, edict of death, right? So thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. And if you remember the scripture... Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So that's what he's, he's, he's writing this at the time that Saul is trying to kill him. Yeah. And he said, we were hungry, we were hungry, but you prepared a table for me yes. right in front of all my enemies and fed me. Yes. And my cup runs over, amen. It's overflowing, praise the Lord. So the 12 loaves of bread, 12 loaves of bread, you got 12 disciples. Twelve is also the divine number of government, yes. or divine government. Praise the Lord. Jesus was establishing a new form of government. David is a type of that. Saul, amen, was great as long as he was small in his own eyes. Yeah. Didn't take long for Saul, once he got to become king, to be big in his own eyes, and everybody else got small, and he would not listen to the Holy Spirit anymore. Remember, the priest told him, don't offer sacrifices, wait I'll, I'll show up when God wants me to show up. You just sit here and trust God. Just like Tim was talking about. Saul couldn't do it. He went in and tried to make himself a priest. Amen. And God took the kingdom from him that day. Amen. Now, he still remained king, but God said, as far as I'm concerned, the, your, king, your kingdom is over. Right? So, on the foundation... Jesus establishes a new form of government. And how does he do it? He establishes it on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Yes. 
All right? So the new kingdom is not established on inflexible rules, amen, of law or religious rituals, but on love. Yes. Praise the Lord. These disciples would become the apostles, a part of a greater kingdom than David ever realized. Praise the Lord. So just like us, they were, these apostles, I'm saying, just like us, were like David's ragtag team of misfits. Look at the, I want to show you something here in the, again in the, in the message Bible. David, uh, after all this takes place, the, the sword, the showbread and everything else, he says he took, uh, let me find it here. David got away and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Uh, when his brothers and others associated with his family heard where he was, they came down and joined him. Not only that, but those who were, but all, excuse me, but all, who were down on their luck came around, losers, vagrants, misfits of all sorts, and David became their leader. Now, I know you don't like to have the finger pointed at you. Praise the Lord. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, or adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're down on their luck. Losers, vagrants, misfits. David became their leader. They became the mighty men of David. Yes. Hallelujah. Mighty men of valor. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. So Hallelujah. they become his mighty men. We are more, the Bible says, we are more than conquerors yes. through Jesus Christ who yes. gave himself for us. Praise the Lord. Amen. These 12 apostles again went preaching the gospel of the kingdom and the present reign of Jesus Christ. That's what they were saying. He is the king of kings. He now is. And we're, that's what they went about preaching it. Amen. They went preaching it from house to house and breaking bread. Yeah. Praise the Lord. It was breaking the bread of his death, burial, and resurrection that they were preaching. Amen. That they were constantly sending that message forth to the people. All right. That's what they did. All right. 1 Samuel 21, verses 8 through 9. 1 Samuel 21, 8 through 9. David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it's here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it. For there is no other save that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it me. So imagine now what this sword meant to David. He brought it there years before. Amen. Right after the victory over Goliath. And it reminded him of past victories. Just what we were talking about here earlier. Amen. That sword reminded David of the promise of God that one day he would be king. Now, I'll tell you this, God has promised in his word that you are kings and priests. Yes. Amen. We need to hang on, yes. amen, to these promises and rec recognize that it has to come to pass. It has yes. to come to flu fruition. It has to be the reality of our lives because God has said it. It must be so. Praise the Lord. Amen. So uh, the sword reminded David of the promise from God that he would one day actually be the king and sit on the throne. Right? All right, so he would be, in the meantime, he was running for his life. He's freaking out. He's, he's, he's not seeing what God said at all. In fact, it's the complete opposite of what God said that he's experiencing, right? So the sword is a reminder of God's promise, amen? And uh, so he's running right at the moment. He's running from this present regime, amen, uh, that's trying to kill him. In fact, it got so bad that he was reduced to living in a cave. I read that Adela, 
this cave where he was hiding out, amen, where he was trying to, to, to keep from being found by Saul's uh, men, amen. He hides in this dark cave of death. Look at, uh, it becomes, he's reduced to basically living in a tomb is what it amounts to. Praise the Lord. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God. Praise the Lord. So I'm still trying to show these parallels. Amen. Jesus, David, and us. Praise God. So, uh, out of this dark cave, out of this place of death, amen, is going to emerge this great king. Amen. A, this is a powerful picture of Jesus Christ. Amen. A powerful picture of him, the king of kings, the greater David, amen, who comes up out of the grave, out of the cave, hallelujah, amen, a, and us. We are kings and priests. Praise the Lord. And even though we were this uh, dead in our trespasses and sins, He has quickened us together, amen, and made us sit together in heavenly places so that in the ages to come He can show the exceeding riches of His grace, of what He promised coming to pass, not because of anything we'd done. You know David wasn't chosen to be king because he was the mightiest or the strongest or the nicest or the best. God knows the end from the beginning. He was going to be an adulterer. He was going to be a murderer. He was going to be a liar. He was going to even contradict the word of God by numbering the people of Israel after he was told not to. But he still trusted God. He still trusted God. And God said, in spite of all that, you're still a man after my own heart. So we judge ourselves. We look at ourselves. We see our failures. We go, well, God can't use me. Listen, you are the prototype of what God wants to make a king, a man, and a priest. Yes. Your failures do not frighten God. They do not intimidate Him in the least. Yes. Praise God. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 8 and 9. 1 Samuel 17 again, verses 8 and 9, please. So this is David, years before, right? He stood and cried unto the armies of Israel. This is Goliath. And he said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? <coughs> Excuse me. Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. Yeah. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. Praise the Lord. Now I want you to know one thing, that the king of kings has already defeated. Yeah, that's right. Amen. He's defeated the enemy. Yes. He stripped him of his ability to do anything to us, amen, which was the word that he used against us, the law, and nailed it, amen, to his cross. Praise the Lord. So that's, that's, that's the one parallel here. But Goliath, remember, Goliath was this guy's name. Now, Goliath, if you read the, the descriptions of Goliath, he was a giant, obviously, and he had six fingers and six toes. Six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. Amen? Six is the number of fallen man. On the sixth day, God created man. That's, that's the, the number of fallen man. So Goliath represents fallen man under control of the devil. The prince of this world, the, the, the prince of the air, praise the Lord. Our heavenly David, Jesus I'm talking about, through the work of the cross, yep. has defeated every enemy. Yes. He defeated the devil and crucified yes. who I was in Adam. Yes. yes. Praise the Lord. Jesus was crucified at Golgotha, a place of the skull. Golgotha comes from the name Goliath of Gath, where Jewish tradition says the head of Goliath was buried Golgotha, the place that the cross would be erected. Jesus. Remember Jesus said, he'll bruise my heel, yes. we'll bruise his head, yes. we'll crush his head, praise the Lord. So when it looks like God's promises have failed, I'm talking to somebody, and if it's nobody else, it's me, praise the Lord, amen. So when it looks like the promises have failed, 
It's been a long time coming. I know I've been told and it hasn't happened yet. And you can bet that David had all of those questions go through his mind for a long time. When God had said this, and yet everything in his life is saying the opposite. It's saying, no, it's not you, buddy. You've missed it. You somehow got screwed up, and it's just you thinking, but it's not the reality. Amen. We get discouraged. We become afraid. Amen. We get doubtful. Amen. We go to our high priest and ask him for the bread that's holy. Ask him for the sword of Goliath. Ask him for the trophy of faith. He is the bread of life. Praise the Lord. A reminder, hallelujah, of past victories. That's what that sword was for. Amen. David didn't get that sword to kill Saul. Because we know he was even in the, cave, in the same cave with Saul. Saul went there to relieve himself. David had the sword and all he did was cut off the hem of his garment and he was ashamed of having done that. He could have run him through right there on the spot. But he didn't do it because he said, I'm not, I will not touch God's anointed. God made the promise. God will make it come to pass. You may think you can make things happen, but not the things that God has promised. Amen. You can try to be better. You can try to do good. And there's nothing wrong with that. But God is the one that gives the increase. God is the one that makes you, that gives you your identity and fulfills that identity himself. That's why it's not the rules and regulations. It's the Word of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. And we need to go back and get that sword. And when you wrap your hand around that truth, you know something's going to happen. Something positive is going to take place. No matter what I'm looking at, amen, there is going to come a victory, praise the Lord, because it's God's victory and not mine. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. So, when you're faced with disappointment, that's life. Yes. You know, I mean, we've got a large family. Things happen. I mean, if you've got kids, you know, yes. there's highs and there's, there's times when they get discouraged, just like we did, just like we may. You know, I don't have all the obstacles in front of me that I had when I was 30. Right? right? Amen. I, I've, got some, I've got some information. I've got some knowledge sure. simply because I've lived longer. Yes. Not because I'm so wise or because I'm so intelligent. or I just lived. I just survived. Yeah. Yeah. And you learn. You look back and you go, well, that was a God. That was God. That was a God thing, you know. Praise the Lord. So when you're faced with these disappointments, and it doesn't look like you're reigning in life. Right. Amen. Go to the house of God. Yeah. Go internal. Amen. Mm-hmm. Feed on the true bread. Yes. His promises. His word, the finished work, reach for the sword, right? The sword of the spirit, reach for the sword, not so you can fight in the battle, but so that you can be reminded that the battle has already been won. It is finished. Praise the Lord. It's only a matter of time and you're going to reign in life. Praise God. Romans chapter five, verse 17. This is the battle. The battle is to stand in what God has promised. If you find yourself in a cave, you just keep standing. You just grab the sword again. Remind yourself of what God has promised. You are more than a conqueror. You are victorious. It may not look like it today, but in heaven it's already settled. He knows the end from the beginning. And for you, it will come to pass if you faint not in the day of adversity. Praise the Lord. Tim said it this morning. A lot of people don't experience the fulfillment because they quit too soon. Yep. You say, well, how long, how, how long is long enough? Till it happens. Till you get it. Till it, till it manifests. Praise the Lord. Praise God. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, yes. Jesus Christ. You are reigning and ruling with Christ right now whether it looks like it or not. That's, right. That's your reality. That needs to be your confession. That's a sword to use against the lies of the enemy. Praise the Lord. So David's living under a covenant of law. Uh, uh, he, he understood grace, though, in ways that a lot of people today don't understand it, who are not under the law. Not legally. I mean, they may, they may still be functioning as though they're under the law because of ignorance. But David knew less about grace than we have access to today. And yet he lived more like a person under grace than a lot of the people that we know today. Amen. 
Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That's the, that's the explanation why God said David is a man after my own heart because we look at it in the natural and we say that cannot be. That doesn't make any sense. This guy is corrupt. This guy is screwed up. This guy makes mistakes. He's greedy. He's selfish. He's, he's just looking out for himself. He just wants what will satisfy him and he don't care what it costs anybody else. And God said, that's my man. Why? Because David understood that righteousness did not come from us. It came from God. It had to be a gift from God or else it was nothing other than filthy rags. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. I mean, come on, God, we need to get this thing settled once and for all. Quit beating ourselves up and beating each other up and start recognizing, hey, we are kings and priests. We are more than conquerors. No weapon formed against us can prosper. Hallelujah. Every tongue that rises in judgment against us, we condemn. Yes. It's the heritage. Yes, it is. It's, it's our inheritance, praise the Lord. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Now, I want you to see this. Because we're still struggling with law and grace. We're hearing grace over and over and over. But the truth is, in the nighttime, in those night seasons, the enemy comes with what? It ain't grace. It's the law. It's the what you screwed up this last week, or what you screwed up yesterday, or what you did or didn't do or should have done and wish you could have did and all, the, all that stuff. That's, that's, that's what he does. So a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So they sold this piece of property, and let's say it sold for $10,000. So they brought $5,000 to give. It was theirs to give, whatever they wanted to give, but they brought half, right? Peter said unto Ananias, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine? In other words, while you had it, wasn't it yours to do with as you pleased? Amen. And after it was sold, wasn't it in your own power to do with it what you wanted? Why hast thou conceived this thing in your heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came upon all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. Praise the Lord. It was about the space. Now, let me just remind you, for those of you who may not have experienced this, I heard this preached many times about tithing. I mean, I, praise the Lord. I'm just saying, that's the law. That's the legal side of this, how they try to use to put fear and scare. Amen. It was about the space three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yeah, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried your husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then she... Then fell she down straightway at his feet, yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, I guess so, and upon as many as heard these things. Just imagine we take up an offering and half the church drops over dead. Great fear would come upon all the place. Amen. I'd be out that door with the offering bag still laying on the floor here. Believe me. Praise the Lord. I'm just saying. Well, now here's the deal. In Hebrew, the word Ananias translates Hanani. That word, that name is grace. Yes. Ananias is grace. Amen. Sapphira, go to Exodus 24 and verse 10. Ananias and Sapphira, right? So here's where the word Sapphira comes from. The law is being given to Moses. They saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stones, which is where the name Sapphira comes from. And as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. So you have the law here for Sapphira, right? So the story in Acts, this is where the law is given. All right, Hananiah is grace. Sapphira is representative of the law. She's a symbol of that, all right? So the story in the Acts, we've been told it was the danger of not giving. It's yours to give. 
He, he actually even tells them that. It's yours to give. You give as you feel free. I'm, God is my source. Right. right? But I also know that sowing, I reap. Yeah. Right? Not just so I can get a, a harvest, but I can't get a harvest if I don't sow. All right, so that's enough about that. But I'm just saying. Notice it didn't say that God killed these people. So they fell down dead. They fell down dead upon hearing the words of Peter. Here's the deal. The message that's being taught here in Acts, the beginning of the church, is that when you mix law and grace, it's not God that kills. It's the mixture that kills. The real problem isn't people who are ignorant of this truth. But it's when we conspire, and I'm talking about the ministry now, but every one of us are kings and priests, so we have the access to other people to bring this gospel to them, right? So whenever we, whenever we conspire to hold back half the price, in other words, we don't preach, it's all grace. We're holding back half of it and preaching half of it as law and half of it as grace, amen. Instead of preaching that Jesus paid the entire price, He completely paid the debt, amen. The debt of the law has been satisfied. Yes. Law has no more to do with us. No. Praise the Lord. What I'm saying is when we hold back half the price, we don't preach that Jesus paid it all, we're causing spiritual death to take place. Remember, this is new covenant. These are, this is a spirit now. We're talking about the spirit of God has been poured out. This is in the book of Acts. We're not dealing back here under the old covenant where it's law, where it's flesh trying to do stuff. That was all a type. It was trying to show us, give us pictures to understand when, the, when grace came, we'd be able to recognize what God was doing. David's a perfect example of this. So anytime that you're hearing a mixture of grace and truth, you're, you're hearing spiritual death being preached. People cannot grow. They cannot manifest. They cannot fulfill their spiritual identity and destiny in God if grace and law are being preached together. You're killing what God has given. Praise the Lord. So Acts 9 verses uh, 1 through 12. So you think, well, it's just, come on, it's just, that's just the way they preach this. That's just their message. No. That is holding back half of what God gave us. Yes. Amen. It's holding back, and it's making half of it about you, that's and you right. can't do anything about it. And, God, and, and the result is, you're dead. You're, you're not going to get anywhere that you need to be spiritually. And then you wonder, why? Why is it that I'm not seeing the manifestation? Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. That's the church. He said, you persecute Don, you're persecuting Jesus. You persecute Sally, you're persecuting Jesus. You persecute Tim, you're persecuting Jesus. Amen. We are Christ in this earth. Amen. So it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. The men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. He was blind. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He was, look at this now, three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, Ananias, and to whom said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Three days and three nights is a picture of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that is what Paul was blind to. All he could see was the law of Moses. Yes. 
Praise the Lord. But there was a man by the name of Ananias. In other words, grace without the law. Praise the Lord. He comes. He touches the eye of Saul of Tarsus, and he becomes Paul, the apostle of grace. Woo! I don't know about anybody else. This just blows my mind. Amen. We cannot mix Ananias and Sapphira. Law and grace. Jesus paid it all. We cannot hold back half the price. We can't remain blind, amen, to the full work, the finished work of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 51. We're about done here. 1 Samuel 17, 45 to 51. See, it is finished. And we are who God says we are. And we can have what God says we can have. He has already paid the price. He's, we, are the, we are the heirs. Yes. So David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Yes. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Praise the Lord. And it came to pass when the Philistines arose and came and drew near, to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistines. David put his hand in his bag, took thence a stone, slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead. That stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw it, their champion was dead, they fled. The battle is the Lord's. Resist the devil. How do you resist the devil? By the word of God, and he will flee. You, you take his head off with the word of God, with the sword of the Spirit. You just say back to him what God said in the first place. He's got no fight for that. He's got no retaliation. He's got nothing he can use, amen, against it. Praise the Lord. Colossians chapter 2, 13 through 15. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. That's why it says to renew your mind yes. by the word of God. In other words, get your brain caught up with your spirit. Yes. Amen. Get your, as I used to say in the Marine Corps, your head and your spirit wired together. Yeah. They use another part of the anatomy, but the idea is the same. Get, Start functioning as one here. You know, you're, you're kind of dysfunctional here. Your brain's saying one thing and your body's doing something else, you know. But and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it away out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Amen? Yes. In it. Praise the Lord. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Yes. Romans 5, 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life. By one Jesus Christ, you shall be kings and priests in this life and rule and reign over every situation, over every circumstance, because the king's word is the final word. And if you're saying what God said, there's no argument. It has to come to pass. Whatever God has promised you, I'm telling you, if you will stand fast, and when you begin to doubt, when your faith begins to shake, go grab that sword. Take the sword and remind yourself what God has said. And I guarantee you, it shall come to pass, even as He has spoken, because God is not a man that He should lie. Amen? Or the Son of Man. He is God. And whatever He says has to come to pass. If someone will say back to Him what He spoke down into this earth, it will not go back to Him void. 
it will produce what he sent it to produce. He sent his word to produce children, to produce sons and daughters of God, to produce an army, to produce a kingdom of kings and priests who would rule and reign forever. Amen. With him on high. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Next time somebody says you're nothing, tell them you better, you better re-look that before you say it again. Amen. I'm your daddy. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm in charge. You can ask who's your, who's your daddy if you want to. But I can tell you who's your daddy. Amen. And I'm his emissary. I'm his ambassador. Hallelujah. I am his king and his priest. Praise the Lord. And nothing, nothing shall be withheld from you if thou canst believe. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen, amen. God bless all of you. Get out there and be who you are. Praise the Lord. Take some authority. We're going to have a, we're going to have a prayer meeting before the election. But I'm telling you, we don't, we don't have to just wait for that. That's a good thing, and we're going to do it, and it's a, it's a positive thing. But we need to take some authority in this nation. I'm not, I, I'm not talking about Democrats and Republicans. I'm talking about the crime. I'm talking yes. about the ungodliness. I'm talking yes. about the disrespect for yes. men and women and race. And I'm talking about God wants to have heaven re rule and reign on earth. And we are the ambassadors. We are the emissaries. We are the kings and priests that enforce that here in this earth. We need to start saying some stuff to this lying world, amen, that's trying to get us to believe that we will back off and hide in a cave somewhere because we're afraid to stand up and say what God has said about the situation. Until we're willing to do that, nothing will change. So don't be ashamed of who you are in Christ. Say it like it is. Amen. And watch the devil run. Praise God. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.